Welcome back guys. Today I want to talk about the absolute cheapest way to get into reloading. It's called the lead loader. And for this demonstration, we are going to use a 762 by 54R. Or as they also call it, and you'll sometimes see it called 762 by 53. This, this kit has several parts. What, what it allows you to do, the basics of it are, you can reload with just this and a hammer. No press required, no additional tools required, this is it. And grab my notes here. I think I had written down the price. Yeah, the, so this, a uh, little under 30 bucks. So 30 bucks for this, a hammer that you've already got in your garage, a rubber mallet, like this, or I brought out another one here, like that. You know, just a soft mallet is all you strictly need. There are some additional things that are gonna help, and we'll talk about that as we go. I've got several other things that uh, I would suggest you purchase, but this is all it takes, and we're gonna do it right out here on the range on this cinder block. This is my Russian Mosin, my 9130, just like everybody has, right? I got the bayonet on there. We're ready to rock. This gun shoots very well. We've shot it quite a bit here on the channel. So that it should make for a nice, uh, a nice test bed. The problem with these Lee Loader kits is the rifle ones, they're really only for bolt actions or maybe uh, lever actions. Your auto loading guns, your AR-15, your AR-10, whatever you've got, your Garand, like this is not a good option for you because what this does, got some factory ammo. This is what we're gonna shoot first. We'll, we'll shoot five shots of this, and then we'll load them, we'll reload them with this, with this uh, loader kit. So when a rifle shot, when a, when a, uh, so when a rifle cartridge gets fired, the whole brass expands to the chamber, right? So this gets bigger, and also, it expands in this direction. The shoulder kind of blows forward to fit the chamber. So when this gets ejected, the brass is pretty close to chamber size. Now these Lee loaders, the only thing they resize is the neck of the case. They, they tighten down the neck again so that we can squeeze another bullet in there. They don't move, they, they don't resize the body of the brass. They don't move the shoulder back like our you know, our, our traditional normal reloading dies, we can basically do what we want. We've got neck sizing dies that only uh, size the neck. We've got full length sizing dies that, that uh, resize the whole body, bump the shoulder back and resize the neck. So in, in a traditional reloading setup, you've got your option of what you want to do. The lead loaders only do the neck. Now that becomes a problem when the body of the, of the cartridge has not been resized it just doesn't feed well in an auto loading in a semi-automatic gun. So these really mainly for, for bolt actions. The other thing you'll find is you know, it, these instructions, we're gonna be doing 7.62 by 54R, but they're, the process is very, very similar for bottleneck rifle stuff. So if you're shooting something different, these instructions should work for you. They also make these for pistol, and I'm gonna be making another video with uh, nine millimeter. Yeah, this is my nine millimeter Lee loader. So if you're wanting something like this for pistol, I'm gonna see if these will run in my Glock. So we'll see, that'll be a different video. The success with these kits really seems to depend on caliber because this 7.62 by 54R kit I found pretty good reviews around the internet for it, saying that it was probably gonna work pretty well. So I don't anticipate having a lot of issues. The nine millimeter pistol, on the other hand, I read a lot of bad things about. So when I bought some of these to try out, I bought a rifle one that I thought was gonna work well and a pistol one that I've got my doubts about. So we'll just see how it goes. The first thing we need though is some empty brass. This is, this is some 150 grain PPU. If you've got a Mosin, you've shot this before, right? Pretty good ammo. This is 150 grain soft point. I wanna shoot a five shot group of these at 50 yards, and that'll give us five, uh, five empty pieces of brass to play with. 
So let's go ahead and do that. Let's shoot a five shot group and then we'll get to business. Okay, so we've got our five empty pieces of brass now. And the first step will be to inspect them. Make sure that there aren't any uh, cracks down the side or cracks, splits in the neck. You just want to give them a good look over. And make sure that there's nothing weird going on. Any case that has a split or uh, a crack should get thrown in the trash. Now, the first step to turning this back into shootable ammunition is to remove the old primer. The lead loader kit comes with something they call, let's see, what do they call this? Decapping chamber is what they call this. It is just a little piece of metal that this is gonna sit down in and it's got an open hole below where the primer is. So you just sit this down in there and then there is a decapping rod which is just a rod with a little thingy there. This goes down the neck and you'll feel it go through the hole. Once it's through the hole, then you just give it a little pop with your hammer. And that's all there is to it. Now the primer is removed and it's sitting inside of actually underneath of our decapping chamber. So let's just go ahead and do these in a batch here. Let's just do all five of them. These come out without much force. Oop, I think I missed the hole. There we go. Now that our five pieces of brass are decapped, these do have See if I can brighten this up a little bit. There we go. These have got some grunginess down inside of the primer pocket. But you're generally just fine for several firings before needing to worry about cleaning that. No problem at all. So for the next step, we jump straight into resizing, which like I mentioned is going to squeeze down that neck a little bit. So we need the big, uh, the big thingy. And one side of this, you'll see that the case almost goes down in there. And in order to resize, all you do is just tap that down inside of there. I think it goes to flush or maybe a little bit below flush. Yep, there we go. So now the case was driven up in there and the neck was resized. Now this is where things get a little bit crazy. We leave our case inside of the sizing thingy there and we grab this, which is the capping chamber or the priming chamber. It's got a, I think it's a little magnet that kind of... Now on the subject of primers, today we're gonna to use CCI large rifle primers. Any generic large rifle primer will work for 7.62x54R. You don't need a Magnum primer. There are large rifle Magnum primers. You don't want those. You want standard vanilla large rifle primers. So today we are going to use CCI. Rows of 10 and we need five. So let me see if I can find a spot to dump out five of these. There we go. There are five new primers. Now, what you'll find is that one of these primers sits down into this recess perfectly. All around it, our little magnet thingy will drop and push that primer up into the case. So this next step is a little bit scary, gotta be honest with you. But if you look at the design of the decapping chamber, I don't really see how you could set off the primer. So 
nothing to worry about, I guess. We take this part, which has our, uh, which has our case inside of it. We set it on top of this, which it sits down in nicely. Then we grab this, which is the, what is this called? The priming rod. This goes down into the case and it's gonna push on the bottom of that case and we're gonna tap on it until the case comes free and then gets pushed down onto the primer. Now the case is in there pretty tight from the resizing process. So this really does kind of take a little bit of uh, effort and I felt it kind of give a little bit and just keep pounding until you, did you hear that uh, sound change? It won't go any further. So if we pull this up, we should now see well, for one, our case is loose now that it's been pushed out. And the primer should be just below flush. Boy, and it looks perfect. So that primer has gone in there very nicely and it is ready to rock. Yep, let's go ahead and do the others. Now, if you're like me, you end up stepping on your brass or you're picking up brass that uh, maybe has some issues and occasionally they look like that. That's actually worse than I intended to, to make it. But let's see, so there's a little bump in the shoulder there you can see. That'll get fire formed out the next time we fire it. So that's nothing to worry about as long as there's no crack and this neck, let's see if the, uh, if the sizing chamber will straighten that out. To be honest, I'm not sure whether it will or not. Tell you what, before we prime this, I'm gonna go ahead and just pop it out just so we can have a look at the neck. Nope, it doesn't look like this is gonna work. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get a view down in there, but yep, the neck of the case is a little bit jagged and I'm not able to get the this guy to go down through and get past the neck. So let's just smack it here. It's probably going to ruin the case. Have another look at it. Yep, that's just bad. Let's see if we can... Uh, See if maybe this guy will go down in there. Just wanna see if I can bend it out a little bit. That actually kind of worked. Just gave it a little bit of a, little bit of a pop. Let's see if this guy will go through there now. Yes, it will. So I'm just kinda of gonna work this out to where it's mostly round and let's, Pop it back in there. Okay, then we pop it out. Still a little bit funky there. But you know what, I wanna try and shoot this because I'm curious whether it'll, uh, whether we can get a bullet seated into it. Because as we seat the bullet down in there, it should iron out maybe a little bit of uh, problems there. So yeah, let's try it. All right, so to prime it, this needs to go back in there. All the way down in there. A new primer goes into the priming cup. This gets set on top. Oops, wrong way. There we go. And I keep forgetting the priming rod. Where'd it go? There it is. So now that goes down in there, pushes on the bottom of the case. I think this is one of those things where you can't really pound too hard, right? You wanna make sure that primer gets seated all the way and pound it until you hear that sound change. Seems to be a pretty good way of doing it. So there's another beautiful primer. 
right? You definitely don't want your primers bulging out at all. You want them flush or slightly below flush. And that's a pretty universal rule. Let's see if we can get maybe a smaller dent. There we go. That's maybe more realistic of what you would see at the range. So let's see if it's able to iron this one out. Priming thingy. Yep, it's going through the neck okay. So there's our new primer. Yeah, now that, that neck looks perfect. No problems to be seen there at all. Primer a little bit below flush, looking good. Okay, the next step is to charge these with powder, is to add powder. And what they do is each kit comes with one of these yellow scoops. And you'll see maybe, filming in the sunlight probably wasn't the best idea. 6.1 cc's is the size of this. And it actually works with a whole lot of different powders. This is an acceptable charge for 762x54R with quite a few powders. It's a bit of a leap though to figure out what powders to buy. And what I wanna do at the end of this video, once we're done out here shooting, I wanna go inside and I wanna step through the process of choosing a powder because that's a little bit intimidating with these kits if you have no reloading experience, being able to pick the right powder and make sure you're not gonna blow your face off. There are cool things you can buy, like this Lee dipper kit that has got a whole bunch of different sizes of dippers, all the way from 4.3 cc's down to 0.3 cc's. And it's got a little lookup table where you can find out how much of each powder each dipper gives you and stuff. We'll go over this back at the bench. What we're gonna use is IMR 40, 4895. This is one of your most common powders that you'll find, and it just so happens to be perfect for this application. The other thing you'll wanna do, so remember the case where we uh, screwed up the, the mouth of the case and it's all jagged and kind of jacked up? This is a deburring and chamfering tool. Couple twists, couple twists, and that skanky case mouth is now a little bit better There you go. Now, the directions here tell you you can use a pocket knife. You know, if you've got a, uh, yeah, just want to use a pocket knife and don't want to spend 10 or $15 on one of these, you can chamfer the inside of the case mouth with a pocket knife. But it's important to have a chamfer on the inside of the, of the case mouth so that the bullet will start easily. See, this kind of goes down in there. If that's not chamfered and has a booger on it, you can really end up with, uh, problems getting your bullets to start or you'll scratch the jacket of the bullet or whatever. It's just bad news, man. Okay, I had to run inside. Where were we? All right, we've got our five cases and I just deburred and chamfered the case mouth on all five of them. So these guys are ready for bullets. Next up is powder. We are going to use IMR 4895, which like I said, after this, we'll... Uh, We'll talk over powder selection a little bit more at the bench. So the reason I had to run inside was the powder dumping method here is you take your decapping chamber, you take one of your rounds and sit it down inside of there, and then you take this and just put it over top of it and then dump the powder into there. And then we're going to put a bullet in there. The problem though is with this dipper, this 3.1 cc dipper, I end up spilling crap everywhere. So I had to run in and get my funnel. This is a leaf funnel, sits down in there, no problem. I really should have leveled my cinder block, shouldn't I have? Stay there. All right, let's see if we can get a scoop before that falls. Now for powder, you just wanna make sure you get, it's all about technique. 
All right, over time, you'll, uh, you'll learn how to get it the way you want it every time, <laughs> the same every time. All right, now our powder just goes down inside of the funnel. Okay, it's all gone down the hole and it should be inside the case. Beautiful. The next thing we do here is go ahead and put the lid back on our powder before we spill, before we spill it. And then the next step is to set a bullet down in here. Where'd my bullets go? There they are. Pointy in this way. And that should start going down that hole. I really should have filmed this earlier when the sunlight was better. See if I can get you a picture of it. Kind of. There's a nice tight fit down there. The bullet will go down in there, but it's a very tight fit. The next step is to put this uh, seating stem thingy over top of there. And this is going to push. We're going to hammer on this until it touches the metal. Now, the problem is we need to set our the overall length of our of our rounds. And that's what this whole thing here is all about. So if we loosen this, I think. Okay, there we go. So now the lock thingy is loose. Now, screwing this up and down should af directly affect the overall length of our of our round. So I'm going to make it out pretty long here. And let's go ahead and seat it and see what overall length that gives us. There we go, that's quite long. Give this guy a couple pops. Yep, no problem there. And if we lift this up, there's our round with the bullet started in there. Now, this is incredibly long. If we compare it to one of our PPU rounds out of the box, you can see, yep, we are way too long. If we pull out our calipers again, we'll find the, the PPU round is right at 2.850, actually 2.847. Looking in the Hornady manual for their 174 grain bullet, they, they show an overall length of 2.855. So right around that 2.85 mark. Let's just round it off and go with 2.850. All right, to get this guy down to 2.850, this is actually going to need to go a long way, but just screwing this down will reduce our overall length. So let's see where that gets us. Sits in there, sits in there, couple pops. We're at 2.994, not too much farther. Hey, beautiful, 2.852. That is just about perfect. So that would be a complete round, ready to fire, ready to rock. So let's run through a couple more here. I guess step one, I should probably get the powder. Go ahead and put the funnel in this guy. Set this down on there and Dump it. Bullet. Cedar. Hammer. Let's see if that, the overall length of this guy agrees with our last one. 2.855, so within just a couple thousandths, that is close enough. Now, before you go up and make, make a bunch of these, what you wanna do is go uh, and make sure that these are gonna chamber in your gun okay. If you try to make your overall length too long, the bullet will actually interfere with the lands of the rifling, and that can be bad and dangerous and, and all that crap. So when you uh, go to close your bolt, hopefully it might be a little bit tight just because of the nature of only neck sizing, 
But if it's really, really, really hard, you might want to pull out your round and inspect your bullet for marks from the rifling. You shouldn't notice much uh, much effort required when you're seating the bullets. They should uh, they should seat pretty easily. That one's 2.853 ish. Yep, this last one's 2.849. So pretty good uh, consistency there with our overall lengths. So there we are. There's our five rounds. Let's see if they blow my face off. So like I was mentioning before, not a bad idea. Just go ahead and close your bolt. Make sure that uh, it seems to run through okay. Make sure that uh, the rifling didn't dig into your bullet at all. It should go, home, it should go in pretty darn easy. All right, let's see if they'll group. All right, we're using the same paper as before, so you guys keep track of where those original five shots are. Okay, first shot was successful. We did not indeed blow our face off. A couple things you want to look at. You want to look at the, the primer. You want to look for splits in the case that might uh, that might point point towards overpressure. I don't see any, so we're good to go. Did we hit the paper? Beautiful, right there in the bottom of the orange. All right, five shots and we didn't blow our face off. Did they group? Heck yeah, they grouped. That was a really nice group. So one thing I'll mention, that those were about 2,450 feet per second. I do have my chronograph out here. And the, uh, the PPUs, I think uh, they were 27 something. So we're about 250 or 300 feet per second slower than the factory ammo. Which is good, which is I consider a good thing. The recoil was nice and light, and we're staying safe since we're, you know, we're not weighing our powder and we're reloading with a hammer. So might as well just stay safe, right? A couple hundred uh, feet per second slower is a good thing. So, all right, let's get back into the bench. Let's kind of wrap things up, collect our thoughts. But looks like a whole lot of success so far. Okay, so I feel like there is about 500 things I need to cover here. I wasn't terribly happy with the lighting out there, so there was a big portions of the, of the footage I just cut out completely. And I wanna go over a couple things here that might have not made any sense. You saw me use a set of calipers. I consider these absolutely necessary. You need to buy yourself a set of calipers that will read to a thousandth of an inch. Hopefully you've already got some sitting in the garage or something, but if not, you, you need them. This is an absolute necessity. So this, a hammer, and a set of calipers will actually get you pretty far. The other thing I did not mention, or I cut it out, and another reason why you need calipers is you need to monitor the length of your brass. Like you can see this brass here is 2.108. The maximum length for 7.62 by 54 R brass 
is uh, 2.114. So this is still 5 thousandths short of trim length. Yep, that one's 6 thousandths short. So the, the cases we were working with are short enough to where they didn't need trimmed the first time. It doesn't look like they would need trimmed here for the second loading. And brass doesn't stretch very much when you're neck sizing like, like we are with this uh, Lee loader kit. So these may never need uh, trimmed. You won't always get this lucky though, like we did with, uh, with our brass here. And sometimes you will need to trim. Let me pull out some old brass, see if I can find a, uh, a long piece. Those all seem short as well. But like I said, so the maximum length is, uh, what was what did I say, 2.114. It's usually, whenever you trim, you generally trim 10 thousandths short of that. So like 2.104. So although these aren't at maximum length, we'll, we'll go ahead and trim them down. The easiest and cheapest way to trim is with this setup right here. This is actually two different things you need to buy from Lee. One is the cutter. This part right here with the knurling on it is the cutter. And the lock stud is the black part here. Those are universal and the same for every caliber. This uh, case length gauge here and the shell holder, which is the silver part that goes on here, is cartridge specific. So these two are specifically for 762x54R. This whole setup runs you like 11 or $12. The two pieces are like five or six bucks a piece. It is very, very simple. So if we just grab, well, for one, we need to decap our brass first. So let me pop the cap out of this guy. Okay, there we go. Now we don't have a uh, primer in there. So this goes into the shell holder and the uh, lock stud, and you just tighten it down, and it grabs a hold of that piece of brass. These, this can actually be put into a drill, even if you're uh, doing a bunch of them, sometimes that'll make it faster. This, just like our decapping rod, goes down and the little pointy end goes through the flash hole. And it is gonna bottom out on the top of the lock stud here. Or, if not, these little cutters are going to trim your brass. So we pop that down into the flash hole and we just twist it. Now, this is not getting touched. Let me try a couple others, see if I can find one. Okay, here's one that it seems like it's gonna take some material off of. So you just tighten the shell down in there, put this down, and just twist it around a couple times, and that'll shave off a couple thousands. So this, this guy definitely did get touched. You can see how shiny it is now but it didn't get touched very much. So I just I wanted to make sure to cover that. There's a cheap answer and definitely a good idea to go ahead and just get a, uh, get a trimming set up. On the subject of brass life, especially when we're just neck sizing like this, this brass will last a long time. It will really, really last a long time. You'll probably find that not very much of it gets trimmed off. It forms to your chamber, and then when you're just neck sizing, there's not a whole lot of work going on with the brass. In normal reloading, whenever we full length size the brass, that's whenever most of the stretching happens. So, shouldn't have to worry too much about uh, stretch. Oh, and, and back to the, uh, yeah, to the subject of brass life, like this 762x54R that we just shot a pretty light load in, I mean, at 10, 15, 20 uh, firings out of this, I mean, that wouldn't surprise me at all. The places to look for issues is, well, one thing I, I really didn't show very well, I, I didn't show it all out there, was after you fire, you want to look at your primer, which is uh, gone now, but if it is... Well, for one, if it's missing, that's a huge sign of overpressure. You might have way too much powder, something's going on, stop what you're doing and reassess the situation. But before they actually pop out and actually blow out, the first sign is they start to get very, very flattened. They'll sometimes get pierced. And sometimes the, the spot where the primer was hit, it'll look like a crater. All of those are, are, are early signs of, uh, of pressure problems. So you wanna watch out for that. 
You want to look for splits, like I had mentioned before. You want to look for any issues down here right above the case head, because that can be a, a, ma a major failure if a horizontal crack or a split develops where the case head and the, and the body of the case meet. So you want to watch out for that. You want to watch out for splits. But beyond that, just keep on reloading them. A couple problems specific to the Mosin. Well, not necessarily totally specific, but pretty specific. This, this PPU brass, perfect for reloading. It's the, uh, it's the one that has one hole in it. This is what we're looking for. This is what we like. There's another type of primer called Burdan primers that have two holes, two small holes. And that can cause major problems because if you've got a piece of Burdan primed brass and you stick this decapping rod down in there, it hits solid brass. It doesn't go through the hole. So if you're having problems finding the flash hole with your decapping pin, you may be looking at Burdan uh, primed brass. That's no good for reloading, at least in the context of this video. So you just want to find yourself a different batch of brass. This PPU brass is great stuff. This is a great, uh, a great way to go. It's just good to hold a PPU brass. It does a nice job. The vast majority of your steel case surplus ammo is, is, is Burdan primed, or actually all of it is as far as I know. And you don't want to mess with uh, trying to reload steel cases, so get you some brass. There's one problem very specific to the Mosin, and that is the bullet diameter. A normal, let's say a 308 or a 30 6 or a normal 30 caliber round uses 308 diameter bullets. The Russian Mosins actually use bigger bullets, 310, 311, 312. The problem though is, is that in reloading, sometimes we do use the, the smaller bullets. They're more available, they're, easy, they're, they're cheaper, easier to get a hold of, and they shoot kind of okay. They're not as accurate as the, uh, as the larger bullets, but they work okay. Well, you can't use them with this kit. This kit, you absolutely must use the large bullets You'll notice here on this sheet, it does say bullet diameter 0 0.310 inches. The bullet I used was 312. Let me show you something real quick. I need to resize a piece of brass. Stand by. Okay, this piece of brass just went through the, uh, through the Lee loader sizer. This is a 308 diameter bullet. The neck is too big to use a 308 diameter bullet. This, this is a 309 diameter bullet. Also, too small to use with this kit. I don't, ha I don't have any 310s, but I wouldn't want to use 310s either. So 311s and 312s or what you need. What we used out there was a 174 grain Hornady 312 diameter bullet. There are also some, uh, here's a 311 diameter Sierra. I would stick with the 311s and 312s. Like here's a 311. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not going in there. So that's, that's good. It's tight enough for, for 311s. And as you saw out there, it's tight enough for, uh, for 312s. And the 312s are not so big that they won't fit through, you know, your uh, bullet seating thingy or whatever. Everything fit and worked great with the 312s. So I would stick with 311s and 312s. If you're just getting started, yeah, this, uh, this combo I used right here was a good combo. This 174 grainer or Hornady also has a 150, 150 grain. 312 bullet, those would be good as well. The other problem with only neck sizing like this is this is really, you need to be reloading for one gun. If you have two guns, they're going to fire form to different sizes. And then if you try and take a, a round from the gun that happens to have the larger chamber and chamber it into the gun that has the smaller chamber, it's either not going to fit or it's going to be really tight. So don't expect to be able to reload for more than one gun at a time with this. Brass will need to be segregated into groups for, uh, for different guns. 
All right, guys, we're almost done. I want to talk about a couple more things you might want to buy. I mentioned calipers you absolutely need. I'll have links for everything down in the description. Uh, a funnel you saw us use out there, I would consider this a must. Unless you happen to have a, uh, a small funnel that would be good for the job, I would go ahead and get one of those. You saw me use the deburring and chamfering tool. I would consider that a must. This does a nice job. Another little tool that's very cheap is a little primer pocket scraper. You know, these, uh, these primer pockets have got two firings on them now, and they getting some goop in there. What, with one of these, you just put it down in there, give it a couple scrapes back and forth, dump out the gunk, and you've got a uh, much cleaner primer pocket. So these are just a couple of bucks. Doesn't take up a lot of space. Not a bad idea to have it. I did not use any lubrication whenever I was resizing these. And I, I, did, I didn't see anywhere in the instructions that you would need to. But uh, you might consider some, some case lube. Like this is Redding Imperial Sizing Dye Wax. You could put a little bit on the, uh, on the case here if you're having problems getting it stuck. To be honest, I don't think it's all that necessary. It's not going to be down in the description. So you can always go to the kitchen, just get a little Crisco or something. Let's see, what else was there? Yep, the, uh, the trimming setup is critical. Was there anything else I had? I don't think so. So that, that's pretty much it. If you get into, uh, you know, if you, if you want to start doing higher loads, you know, closer to maximum, and you're uh, starting to worry about the accuracy of just scooping the powder and measuring it by volume, you can get a little cheap uh, digital scale these days for a very reasonable price. Like 15, 20 bucks, I think, something like that. I don't know, it'll be in the, I have a link in the description. But this will measure in grains. You can measure out your, uh, your charge weights and it'll give you a whole lot more flexibility when choosing powders, no doubt about it. And speaking of that, the, uh, the powder measure kit that I showed, this is only 10 or $11. It's worth every penny. And not only for that, but it comes with this lookup thingy that has a, a lookup table for all of your various powders and how many grains a scoop corresponds to. So this is a very wise investment for this setup, no doubt about it. And last is a reloading manual. Not a bad thing to read up on the process. You've got uh, load data for lots of different stuff. And actually this is where I was at for, uh, for 762 Russian. And this, is, this happens to be the Hornady 9th edition. They put out a 10th edition not too long ago. The 762x54R data is all the same as far as I remember. So you might be able to pick up a Hornady 9th edition for next to nothing right now. So get you a manual or whatever bullet manufacturer you plan to shoot. If you're gonna shoot a lot of Hornady bullets, get yourself a Hornady manual. Sierra, get yourself a Sierra manual. And that's about all it comes down to. One thing I did not realize they only make these in nine different cartridges. I'll put them all here, here on the screen. So it's just, it's nine very uh, popular cartridges. And I was able to look up, we're, we're kind of getting, we need to move into, this is the last thing I want to discuss, and that's how to pick a powder. And maybe even how to pick a bullet, I guess you could say. But how, to, how to get ready. Like if you're wanting to order one of these today and, and start playing around, how do you make your shopping list to go out and buy bullets and powder for what you want to do? So I want to walk you through that process. And for these nine, I was able to look up and see what size scoop they come with. So you can see the 223 comes with a 1.6 cc scoop. That's the smallest one. And then let's see who's the biggest. The 30-06 comes with a 3.7 cc scoop. Our 7.62 by 54R came with a 3.1. So that's your first bit of knowledge that you need to that you need to write down as you go forward. And let's just let's pick one of these. 
let's just go with 223, the one I already mentioned. It has got a 1.6 cc scoop. So if we know that, we should be able to come up with some combination of bullet and powder that'll work for us. And I wanna step you guys through this process really quick. The first step I would make, if you don't have a reloading manual, is to go to the Hodgton website. Hodgton is, uh, Hodgton covers Hodgton powders, IMR powders, and Winchester powders. All three of those powders, you get uh, data through the Hodgton website. And Hodgton powders just seem to be the easiest to find. So if you're going into a random reloading store, that's probably mostly what they'll have on hand is, is Hodgton brand powders. This is the Hodgton uh, website which I'll have a link for down in the description. But right here in the middle, you go to rifle and click there. And now on the left, we need to select a cartridge. And 223 Remington is in the drop down box. There it is. Now you can see, you can choose bullet weights, you can choose powder manufacturers, or you can choose powders themselves. We want to start with bullet weight. So with, with 223, I like to shoot, uh, 69s and 77s. So we want to explore what powders might work in those two weights. And let's click on get data. And that, if we scroll down, it shows 29 different loads. They've got the 69 grain Sierra hollow point boat tail, which is the 69 grain Sierra match king. And you can see lots of powders to choose from here. Down here, we hit the little plus symbol to expand the 77. And lots of different powders that work with this guy. So let's pick a couple. CFE 223 is a very popular powder. So let's let's kind of, let's write down CFE 223. Varget is also pretty common. You might find that one pretty easily. Uh, IMR 4895, which we already used for 762x54R. Let's, uh, let's choose that guy and let's choose H335. So those four powders, CFE 223, Varget, 4895, and H335. Now, what we need to do is figure out what weight of powder our 1.6 cc scoop will get us. Luckily, the, the Lee website does have this Lee Dipper capacity chart. Of course, I'll have a link in the description for this guy as well. And if we look across the top in the bold black, we see our different CC numbers. Ours is a 1.6, which is just about right there in the middle. So I've got my finger on my screen, keeping track of which column that is. So let's scroll down until we find one of our four powders. See if we can find, okay, there is CFE 223, right there. There it is. And the 1.6 CC scoop, looks like that will get us 24.8 grains. Okay, let's write that down, 24.8. Let's move on to, let's see what's next. There's, uh, at the very bottom there is H-Varget. That's Hodgton Varget, that will be 21.9 grains. Just below it here is H-335 at 24.8 grains. And the last one we need to look up is IMR 48.95, there it is, and that guy is 26.1 grains. Hang on, that doesn't seem right. I think I'm, I got my columns mixed up. Yeah, there it is, 22.0 grains of IMR 48.95, right there. That's the one. Okay, so now we know what charge weight the scoops gets us. So now let's go back to the Hodgton website and let's see. Okay. First one, 69 grain Sierra match King CFE 223. Our scoop gets us 24.8. The starting load is 23.5 and the maximum load is 25.8. Our scoop gets us 24.8. That is perfect. So that would be right in the middle. If we could find uh, a box of 69 grain Sierra Match Kings, or yep, that bullet, and a pound of CFE 223, we'd be in business with our 1.6 cc scoop. Let's check on the others, Hodgton Varget. Our scoop gets us 21.9 grains. 
and that's not enough powder for the 69 grainer. So we're under with the Varget. H335, our scoop gets us 24.8 grains. And you can see that's a little bit over the maximum load. So that's danger, danger. We don't want to go with that. And IMR 4895, our scoop gets us 22.0 grains. So that's under the starting load. So of the four we picked really quick, it looks like CFE 223 would be the best candidate for the 69 grain bullet. Let's go down and look at the 77 grain bullets. Now CFE 223... 24.8 is above max. So now with with uh, with the 77 grain bullet, our uh, CFE 223 is above max. Let's check on Varget, which is 21.9. Starting charge is 21.0, and 23.7 is the maximum. So it looks like Varget would be perfect with the 77 grain bullet. Yep, that would be just about perfect. Let's see, H335 is 24.8 grains. We're still way over max with H335, so that's a no-no. And IMR 4895, which is right there. Our scoop gets us 22.0. Our starting charge is 20, and maximum charge is 23, so that's perfect. So with the 77 grain bullet, Varget or IMR 4895 would be perfect. So I know that was probably difficult to follow. Maybe, maybe not, but it is, uh, it's, it's difficult. There's that step in between where you really got to do, do some homework and figure out what, uh, what powder is going to work with your scoop. To be honest, man, just spend 10 or $11 and buy the full scoop kit so that you've got them all. And at that point, no matter what charge weight is called for with a given powder, you're going to have a scoop that'll get you there. So that's uh, definitely worth the little bit of money that it costs. Holy crap, I think this is finally over. This video, I always knew it was going to be complicated and a lot of things I wanted to say. And I'm sure that as soon as I stop this, I'm going to remember 10 things that I meant to to add, but we've got to end it somewhere. And I think that somewhere is right here. I am very pleased with the, with the kit. I don't think there is any better way to, uh, to dabble. You know, if you just want to get into reloading a little bit, you got no space. I don't know if you're a prepper, I don't, whatever, but, or if you need to hide it from your wife, this is a pretty good option. It is a pretty good option. So, hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.